Welcome, everybody. Uh, just so you guys are aware, it was intentional that there was no sound on the feed. We're just kind of setting the tone, showing you guys the space. And then at some point, which is right now, the audio comes on. You guys can hear us all loud and clear, hopefully. Welcome to the podcast. First of all, we have three amazing guests here. We'll start with Troy Canadian, who is the man of podcasts. So I don't think he needs any introduction. Yep. Super Seth, who's had a phenomenal year so far with the Sonics. Pre pretty good year, I would say. And a very new and young addition to the NAL in M, Emma, Marm, Marmalade, who has joined Mirage. And is about to do our first season of Pro League. Yeah. Well, it's exciting. It is exciting, right? Yeah. So we have some, I was going to call this episode like the, the Boomers and the Zoomer, because we have like <laughs> the old veterans and we have a newcomer. But the topics of the day will be very basic. It'll be, you know, Invitationals Recap. Roster changes, attack or repick, all the things that are very current and very relevant in the space. And basically the changes that we saw going from right before Invite until where we are right now, basically. But starting at the most recent, which is basically the big one, six invitationals. Three of us kind of worked it in some form of capacity. Obviously, Troy and Super, you guys both played at it. I had the pleasure of casting it. Uh, and Marm, you had a different approach to it because you weren't at the event itself in Sweden. No. But I assume you saw it from home. Yeah, PC. it was early. What was that like, <laughs> watching the team shows? The games, they were really early, so it was like kind of unfortunate. Um, Very but, early. <laughs> so I was mostly tired during that, but it was it was really fun to watch. Um, it was kind of unfortunate that they didn't do it in Canada, but, you know, there's some really good games, so I, I enjoyed watching them. Were you watching the Six Invitationals knowing that you would be in Pro League in the season to follow, or were you watching it just as a fan, as a spectator? Just as a spectator, I had, I had no idea. I was kind of like taking like a break after stage three of CL. Um, so I was just kind of like, just like watching and kind of bummed that I wasn't playing comp. So so you didn't know if you were playing and a lot of people said they didn't know if you were going to be playing in the future because when you guys announced that Joe Bro was going to go to analyst from coach, I think a lot of people, including the social media manager of Sonics themselves, were like, we're going to get a super coach coming soon in the near future and you've spoken openly about the possibility of you stepping down and retiring as a player but it looks to me as you're going to be staying on for the foreseeable future uh yeah so obviously we weren't sure of the success that we had with the uh team uh once we picked those guys up to kind of join me so my plan was to kind of just because we knew joe was going to leave before the year even started like this is something that we've already known um so the plan was that i was just going to go to coach after the year but we were going to use the year to kind of me and joe to set like you know how, how we're going to play that kind of thing um so there's like a foundation and then obviously i'd be able to continue that as a coach but not have as much in-game uh like impact um but obviously with our success and you know a couple of people on the team also asked me to not stop playing um and i care more about the team than really what i would you know what i'm thinking so uh with that i just decided to play and you know obviously with the amount of success we've had there's really no reason to um, break up the team it's the best team any of anybody on our team's ever been on yeah so there it would kind of just be silly i think to bring in somebody else because i, I think i can say it now but like obviously I think people are aware that I probably have a more input than most people on the team. So like I already knew who I wanted to replace me. <laughs> and if we couldn't get those people, I wasn't going to leave anyway, because yeah. I'm not going to leave if I think somebody is not better than me or more useful than me. And I don't think many people are more useful than me. So it also just didn't work out where we could get somebody that I wanted. And yeah, here to stay uh, all 2022 going to be the same Sonics team for all of 2022 confirmed. Yeah, we're not. We cool. don't. We don't make mid-season changes. I like it. We are just absolutely terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Makes sense. And I guess the same story, similar for you as well, Troy, because you guys played Imitationals with Dark Zero, and you guys also looking to just like you know keep it the same. At least there has been no announcements yet. Yep. And kind of run it down one more time and see what happens. Yep. Uh, we didn't have too long together as a roster. We had what, like six six months roughly. I don't even know if it was exactly six months, but about like six months together as a roster. So. Uh, we were definitely happy with our improvement. We went from, it looked like we weren't even going to make the Sweden major. Actually, we were literally a map away from going to relegations, <laughs> apparently. Um, and then 
made the Sweden major, got grouped. Obviously, weren't happy about that, but mm. was what it was. And then had a solid performance at our first NA finals. Lost to Sep. Yeah. <laughs> and then, uh, and then we got top eight uh, at invite. Obviously, we do think we can do better mm. and looking to do better. But I'd say within the time frame we had and with kind of the state of the scene right now and how competitive it is, mm. I don't think it's anything to be ashamed of. So, yeah, just continuing on that path and continuing to improve. I don't think we've reached a plateau whatsoever. Uh, I don't think there's any, any signs of that. So just continuing to work and improve. I mean, North America as a region surprised a lot of people at Invitationals because myself included kind of, I checked you guys, I clocked you guys out, like NA's probably not going to do amazing. And you guys were, you went the furthest as a region across the board. Obviously, no one really looked incredibly weak or anything like that. Nobody fell out early. Yeah. Not really. Um, and then North America also ends up winning Invitationals. Yeah. And not, not just North America, but a team that I think setting expectations you said you're you know happy with top eight i don't think anyone expected tsm to be the winner of a tournament like the six invitationals going into it they barely made it open yeah. qualifier or taking the close qualifier for them what does that mean for north america going forward troy is that is the hammer now at any mean that na is one of the stronger regions again or is that just all like placebo and it doesn't matter like what's your take on that i think the whole region discussion <laughs> Is a whole load of bullshit. What a bullshit. And I know you guys love talking about it, so we're going to talk about it. But I think it's at the end of the day, just like it only matters who's good at a certain event. And leading up to SI, yeah, NA looked bad. And honestly, even like EU looked bad. Like everyone other than Brazil looked bad. Yeah. But show up and all the, honestly, all the regions performed. I think the worst performing region was by far EU. I would say, but like, I'm not going to sit here and say use a garbage region now. I don't think they are, but mm. I mean, I know you guys want to think that and we'll have that fun, you know, calling EU trash in the chat, but <laughs> that's just not the case. Every region's competitive. Yeah. Metas will shift. Certain teams will become better. Certain teams will become worse. You know, we'll play at events. We'll learn from the teams that are doing the best. And that's just how it goes. No team. I don't think any region is going to dominate. I think the only time I've thought that is when... Like in other games when like Koreans have dominated mm. and I think it's purely because of work ethic. Yeah. And like they figured things out and they they kind of stay at the top because of their work ethic. And yes, that could technically happen in Siege, but I don't know if it will. But other than that, like I don't see any region having like some sort of quality that sets them ahead of others. I think it's just constantly teetering. We spoke briefly, actually, while the camera feed was on, but the microphones were muted about work ethic and how many hours that teams put in these days and how competitive the regions are. Back in year one, I mean, we played not even every day. It was maybe a couple hours when we mm -hmm. did play. And I mean, scrims were maybe one or two maps. You know, the round count was less. Mm -hmm. Nowadays, we're talking between three and six maps a day for most teams, probably. Each map averaging about an hour. You play the 12 rounds, six defense, uh, six attack. If you don't want to talk about it, you don't have to, but roughly what does an everyday situation look for each of you for your respective teams? Um, so I'd say right now we probably go it's probably about like eight to ten hours a day, uh, yeah. six days a week. Uh, we usually start around 10 a.m. and go until yeah, like six, seven. Um, and that that can that can change. Some days are some days are shorter, some days are longer. Some days, like we said, feature more more scrimming, more playing. Some are more just talking, VODs, stuff like that. Um, but it's just a day-to-day -day thing. Uh, but six days a week usually and yeah, around eight to ten hours. Is it the same story for the uh, the younger the younger player, Marm, or uh -huh. a different story? Well, it's, it's very different right now because, I mean, we have you guys are new, of three course. new people on yeah. the team, um, myself included. So it's more of like kind of getting everyone on the same page of like what we want to do. Um, but I mean, we usually start at like noon and get done at like six every day. Um, but then, you know, like obviously like, with the being a newer team, we just have a lot more stuff to kind of like get through. Um, but yeah, it's been fun so far. So I'll enjoy it. How many days has it been since you guys kind of started your internal situation with like the, you know the five men rush that you have now has it been a week has it been less because the announcement is very recent yeah um it's probably been a week um 
you know, in person. Yesterday was my first full day here scrimming because mm. um, I got here Thursday. Uh, but it's probably been like a full like a full week of just trying to just get everyone on the same page and try to get everyone to that point. Cool. Then we have Mr. Coach Streamer, Match Analyzer, Vot Reviewer, Semi Coach, Captain IGL, Super. Yeah. Do you just do your team's work yourself? Or? Um, yeah, so we don't dry run or watch VODs. I just do that. So I, I even made a YouTube video about how I go about making strats. But basically, I'll come up with strats for um, you know whatever map we want, put it on Google Docs. Everybody has a second monitor, at least nowadays. So we'll, I'll just say, hey, there's new strats for whatever. Hop into a scrim. We'll look at the, we'll just play. And then, you know, if there's issues with setups, um, because maybe sometimes I'll put like one many two walls or like an extra barb or it just will be impossible for somebody to do. We'll make that adjustment. Um, and then, you know, after a few scrims of it, you'll get an idea if it's something that can work or if it's just like trash and then you, you try another strat. And yeah, I mean, for us, um, most days we're going to try to do t uh, six maps. So that's two different scrims. Um, but that's also because, you know, unlike I think the majority of teams, we don't sit there and just like watch VODs and we don't sit there and we just, you know, dry run for hours. Um, I kind of think it's unnecessary because, you know, if the, you know, obviously I think in the game now, everybody can make like calls and like be able to play make but for me as the main person who's making calls i really think only i kind of need to know a lot of certain things that i would rather not have my team even know because like i, I think we're more adaptable and like more play makey than a lot of the teams but if if my team all sits down and watches a vod and then this vod you know they're expecting this person here this person there all this that doesn't necessarily mean the other team's actually going to be there, but then my team might be afraid to do something because they think somebody's there. So I'd rather them just not know at all, right? Because you mm -hmm. still would get that same information in the game, but you're not assuming things. Um, so yeah, but in terms of like what you said, hours, uh, you know, I said before we went live here is like, especially in NA, all of the people are getting paid to an extent where it's like a, a full-time job and you know everybody for the most part living at team houses too so you don't even have like you know you're not paying rent or anything on a house so i would expect everybody to put in the same amount of hours you would at a job it's like six days a week eight hours of whatever you're doing obviously you can do more but i think if you're not doing like minimum eight hours you're kind of like cheating your employer in a way because like if you had a real job at an office and you went in you know, like a three map scrim might be like three or four hours and you sit there and you, you know, you finish the scrim and you leave, you wouldn't go to work and then like work until lunchtime and then be like, okay, well, see you tomorrow. Like <laughs> you would get fired. So it's kind of how I think people should treat it as a real job. Obviously to some extent, it's a little harder because of cheaters and stuff, but you can always find other things to do. Um, just depends if you're lazy or not, in my opinion. Yeah. No, I think it makes sense. And not everybody has the same moral compass where they will feel bad about not screaming eight, nine, ten hours a day. I mean, a lot of people, they speak about DC and how, how too much they scream and how too much work they put in sometimes, in the past at least. But I feel like most regions these days are all increasing their workload to like kind of match that boundary because if everyone's working harder than you, eventually you should be falling behind. Yeah, right? I think I think it's just a simple way of thinking. It's just, yeah, people, people will get ahead of you if if you don't play enough, if people are playing way more than you, if people are thinking about the game way more than you, they're going to be better than you probably in the long term. Maybe, obviously, you have to take into account like some burnout things, stuff like that. But uh, I, I think at the end of the day, like playing yeah eight hours, I think that's actually that's incredibly reasonable because it's just like a job and it's it's a good amount of time. Mm -hmm. There's definitely people that are putting in more time than that, and if you want to, you put in more time than that, but. I do think that should be what is required. What about the situation of living with your teammates? Because let's say in, in Europe, for example, it's not very common. We boot camp, mm -hmm. but you don't live with your team. In Brazil, they tend to, at least in the past. In North America, you're all localized here in Vegas. Marm, for example, you went from playing online, rank, you know, CL, tier three, etc. Yeah. Now you're living with your with your boys, with the teammates, every single day, practicing, yeah. playing. You'll be playing in person with them as well every week when the NAL starts. 
is there a big difference going from online with the teammates to in person with the teammates? Oh, uh, I think it's definitely more fun to like you know be side by side with your teammates and you know fist bump after every round or whatever. Um, uh, the vibes. Yeah. Um, no, but I mean like I've had roommates and I've lived with like my siblings and stuff, so it's not anything new. Um, but I I think it's definitely like a change. But yeah, it's fun. What about do you have a story? I'm just curious. Do you have a story regarding like how you actually made the team? Because I think a lot of people are curious what actually happened. Like how do you go from not seeming to be in Pro League to then all of a sudden be announced that you indeed are in Pro League? Is it a phone call? Is it an email? Is it a Discord chat? Uh, what happened? It's a, it's a Twitter DM. Twitter DM. Well, that's a classic. From the coach. Um, I just woke up and I got it and I was like, is this real? I didn't think it was real. I thought it was a joke. So are you kidding me? <laughs> yeah, I'm like, um, but then I, I called my mom and I she, I started crying. She started crying. Um, and then I was like happy and then I got really, really anxious. Yeah. And for a few days, I was like, kind of just like an anxiety spiral. Um, and then I got here and it's just like, I don't know what I was worrying about. Like, this is, this is amazing. So uh, yeah. I thought, I, I, yeah, I was just going to say, I thought that was extremely fitting too because from what i understand like marm cl teams for some reason weren't even trying her out mm. but she gets on a pro league team and it made me think of you know like rest in peace to kicks but i was watching his stream one time and somebody he was uh casting an fpl game and he was specifically talking about marm and like somebody in chat asked her asked him if if he thought marm could be in pro league because you know i've i've said for a long time i thought she was good enough too and he literally said, and it was like very candid that he thought she should be in pro league, but that she thought he thought she wouldn't ever be because mm -hmm. people didn't want to pick up a, a woman, yeah. it would make him uncomfortable. So you know, I, I think that's big props to to Mirage for being you know willing to. I mean, who cares if you're t if if a person is good? Like, what does it matter? You know. So I think that's definitely props to them. I feel like maybe because everybody lives together now and stuff, like they're worried about it being uncomfortable. But it's like. I mean, you you have to talk to a girl at some point in your life. Like <laughs> it'll be okay. So you know, definitely props to them. But I, I'm definitely excited for her because she was just not getting the opportunities. I think her talent should have uh, been giving her. Is that something that you've kept in mind as well, Marm? With like going to this, it's 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 kind of a big deal, even though it shouldn't be necessarily. But yeah, the possible pressure and anxiety, as you mentioned as well, that comes with the job as well. That's something that you've kind of mentally put thought into. Like this is gonna maybe suck for a little bit in the beginning, mm -hmm. but then I have my teammates that support me, my family supports me, my mother, my mother supports me. Yeah. Is that like the internal process that really helps you to commit to it? Uh, Yeah, I think so. Um, Like I said, like after I got like the call or whatever, like the first few days, like really rough. Yeah. Um, I was like, do I want to do this? Like all this anxiety I'm feeling. Um, But then I think like, yeah, my family and my teammates, they just made it like 20 times better. Um, And I think just like getting out here and like, kind of getting in the rhythm of things like really just like solidified that good i mean worst case i know a lot of new players or i, I assume that it's not new players they will go into that game you know first game of pro league i think the most important thing for me when i started pro league was like the first kill that i ever got right you get into the server if you go zero five and you're entering the sixth round it's like oh god <laughs> i'm dropping a ball here it's not good right or, or worse than that the first kill i think is going to be a massive like boulder off your shoulders like okay i can get a kill in pro league i can actually compete at this level if yeah. you get it first round you just activate it from the get-go that's like the best case scenario yeah but if you don't want it to get a kill if you don't get activated in the round just pull that pull a super just have value elsewhere right yeah. whether it's communication guidance like yelling or just spending way too many hours studying the game because your teammates don't have the attention span to do it whichever the case might be yeah and use that excuse for yourself to be like this is okay because despite i'm not being on the scoreboard i have value elsewhere for my team yeah yeah at the end of the day, it's just about the team. Yeah, it right? is about the team. A win's a win. A yeah. win is a win. And some teams can win with somebody caring super hard. Maybe all five people putting in a great effort. And some teams, they have maybe one or two people individually playing well. I mean, Invitational itself was like the story of most teams having two or three players, a trio or a duo, just absolutely carrying the stats. Yeah. And yet, it was those kind of teams that ended up making it very far. I mean, TSM, the winning team, that was like the holy trio that Caster spoke about. Yep. Um in America Chief and Bolo, and then you had Challenge you at the bottom, just kind of vibing. But you, everyone usually, shows up eventually. Usually when a team has a system and when the system is clicking, there mm -hmm. are three people getting the kills. Yeah. Yeah. Sometimes a fourth, but usually it's it's around there. And there's definitely a guy that is not getting any. 
Yeah, I mean, I mean, if you're droning in, you're injured, your injury gets two kills in a round. The second you get off drones, it's 5v3, right? Yep. Then your job as support players to breach open the wall, maybe go over a plant. You might get C4 while planning and get it down, and your round is over. Yep. And that's that. So stats don't tell the whole picture, do they? They do not. Yeah, I think I think NA kind of take that to an extreme, too, because, like, if you look at SI, for example, uh, TSM had a guy who was, like, negative 56. Mm. I was negative 60-something. Yeah, uh, I think all of the NA teams had somebody like negative thirty or worse. Like, um, but obviously the teams are still doing well, so it's it's going towards a greater like good. And obviously that's not necessarily something like a spectator is going to see. They're going to see like, oh, this guy's negative thirty, like washed or something. <laughs> but like, at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is winning. So you know, even if you're going negative, like. Geo, even if you're going negative 56, yeah. you're winning a million dollars. So <laughs> you're doing good. something that's helping your team. And, and that's at the end of the day, that's all really anybody should care about. Yeah. Mm. And to kind of wrap up invitationals and whatnot, do any of you here think that there's a regional difference or is that something that's kind of slowly fading away? Because before invitationals happened in 2022, people said Latsim super aggressive, good gun skill, APAC is like chaotic and unpredictable. And then even in air, kind of like less identifiable, I would say. But I, I personally wouldn't say that there's like a clear cut. This region does this so much better these days. Yeah, I think it, it's been more and more going away from that. I think the better teams more and more have their own kind of identities. I do actually think TSM and Empire are actually like similar teams in that identity. I do think they kind of they stick to like their core things that they like to do and just repeating them and running them and you know just like not not changing what what already works basically um and then there's obviously uh i can't even think of examples off the top of my head but there's there's other teams like nip um that it's almost hard to identify how they do play cuz they're it, it's kind of hard to see like the their end goal almost yeah. um at least at a glance from a vod um uh, and then yeah, teams like TSM Empire, where it's very clear. There's teams with more of a hybrid, which I think a decent amount of NA teams have. But yeah, just some examples off the top of my head. Uh, and like Liquid, I guess, is even more on like the uh, kind of like TSM and Empire, where it's a lot more repetitive. Yeah, I think I think there's different teams from different regions with all these different kind of aspects. And even APAC, for example, like I actually think Damwon is a very repetitive team. Mm. Um, Whereas a team like Cyclops, like you're loading in, you don't know what's about to happen. Yeah. Right. Um, so I, th I think it definitely varies from team to team more than anything. And if, if you had to pick one team from Invite 2022 that you enjoyed watching the most throughout the entire tournament, could be one game, could be all of them combined, which team would you think roughly? Watching the most. I've always liked watching Empire play, um, but that's just like a personal bias. I just think they play very it's just very clean siege and uh, my favorite player to watch is, Sh is shepherd and i just think he like when i watch him i feel like he always makes the right decision mm. um so i always enjoy watching them um also have like the rivalries there um and i consider some of those guys friends so i i definitely enjoy watching them but yeah uh i would say empire for me okay same story, Marm. Was there a team that stood out to you doing invite? And do you think there are any regional strengths watching SI 2022? Um, I think probably like the team I enjoyed watching the most was Damwon. Um, Fan favorite. Just like how they played. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was just like so fun to just like watch like every game they went into, like like just like the energy they had, even if they were down. Um, I think it was just like really fun to watch them. Um, I think like regional disparity, like disparity. Um, it's kind of like. Like Troy said, like every team kind of has like their own identity now, um, more than like regional kind of thing. Um, so, yeah, just like kind of like whatever works for your team works for your team. So, so instead of looking at NA, we gotta look at you know TSM, DC, like the yeah. individual teams in the region, how they play, rather than how does NA play overall. Yeah. Any changes or difference of opinion, Seth? Um, in terms of like my favorite team, for the same reason I don't do jersey swaps, I'm not a fan of like the people I play against. Like you're on the same level as me. I don't I'm not a fan of you. You're my competitor. Um, but in terms of regions, I think it's literally just 
I, I think you can go into something, and I think we did this, which is why we we progressive. My bad. We progressive. <laughs> okay, I'm freaking out now. All right, so we progressively got like better as you know we had more international experience. Yeah, but I definitely think we went into like our first major and our second major, kind of assuming LATAM play crazy, APEC play crazy, EU play bad, NA play <laughs> structured, but. In reality, it's like liquid, very slow. Phase, very fast. You know, Damwon, fast, but very structured. Mm. Elevate, ranked. Like, there are certain styles that every single team have, and you can't just assume, like, people are playing away because they're from this region. I think um, it's kind of unrelated, but I'm really interested to see, like, the exit thing because, you know, they're bringing in a Brazilian coach to, I assume, try to play a Brazilian style, but they don't have Brazilian players. They have, um, like, American Brazilian players, but they're, they're not from that region. So it's not like... I'm curious if they think it's just, like, in your blood, like, you can just play, like, <laughs> Maniac, like, without ever doing that. Hmm. So, you know, I, I, that's completely unrelated. It just made me think of how ridiculous that is. But, yeah, I'm, I'm... No, I think the better teams are just the better teams a lot of times. It can be matchups on certain maps. Some teams have played better maps. Better, like, for instance, us. We scrum Villa a lot leading up to SI. We were pretty good on Villa against NA teams. And even EU teams scrimming that, we played Villa there and got it looked like we never played it before. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that's probably just because those regions are probably a little bit better at that map than what we were going against. So it's definitely matchups and styles of teams. Speaking of Sonics, we had a... Uh... We had two phenomenal performances in particular that happened at ESI for you guys, which is, of course, Kansas 1 versus 4 mm -hmm. against them on Key on Bank. And then Gurks are getting like a 1.31 like, average rating across this board or something along those lines, yep. basically being a number rated player for the majority of the event. Mm -hmm. I would like you to walk me through, if you can, the 1 versus 4 clutch, because I, I didn't watch the replay back, but were you on camera so you seeing the kill feed pop off? Are you watching the player trying to give information? What was it like being in the team speed server? Yeah, so I think it was uh, it was me and him, and it was a 2v5, and I think I killed somebody, and then I died. So he was in a 1v4, mm. and we did have, I think, a maestro cam still in kitchen, so we at least knew where the planter was, and we knew there was a guy covering. The other two kills he got, like, one guy walked into the flag door, and then he killed somebody else. Um, I, I don't think he had calls on that. I think it was, like, sound. Um, so once he killed those first two... Evan kind of has this thing where, like, in scrims and stuff, he'll clutch a lot. He's one of our more, like, clutch kind of players. And usually when he gets, like, the first two, like, he'll do, like, he, like, does this, like, flick thing. <laughs> and once he does that, like, he's going to win the round because it's, like, feeling it or whatever. <laughs> so he killed those first two guys, and it's weird to say, but I thought he was going to win the round. Obviously, you know, his SMG 11 and especially that last shot he hit yep. where it was like a guy on the staircase. That's like not a lot of people hit that shot. But I mean, I think he's pretty underrated because of certain people. Like obviously our team has really stand up performances, but he's he's a really good player. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm always happy for people, especially like him, who maybe don't get the recognition they necessarily deserve to kind of have those like standout moments where people are like, you know, holy shit, this guy's insane kind of thing. Um, so, you know, that that was a really good moment for him. Certainly one of the possible biggest or best plays of the year that we might see this year in Rebel Six Siege. And it happened at the biggest event of the year as well, being Six Invitationals. So that's quite nice for him. In terms of going forward after Invitationals, we have quite a lot of changes coming to the NAL and every single league for that matter going into this year. For example, the new map pool which there are very mixed opinions about across social media, whether it's the fact that there's nine maps instead of seven, whether it's the maps that they're introducing, Coastline is going out, we're getting Sky, and we're getting Border in, as well as Theme Park. I want to start with you, Marm, a player who doesn't really have a bias, because in the same way, at least, because you haven't played these maps at the tier one level before. Yeah. Nine map pool, yes or no, do you like seven more, just from a you know rough perspective? And then what about the maps that they're putting in instead? Uh, I think nine's going to be interesting. I mean, I've always played with seven, um, and I'd never played any of the new maps in comp before. Mm, that's um, fun. <laughs> I've always, I only played them in ranked, so it's kind of been fun, like trying to like figure out how to play them in like a more of a comp setting. 
Um, but I'm just curious how Nine Maps is gonna work for like banning and stuff like that for um for the NAL because I have no idea. But I think it's gonna spice things up. So, no, yeah, certainly. Yeah. And uh, I mean, Troy, you said right before the stream started that uh, it's hard to scrim Nine Maps. <laughs> yeah, right. I mean, I. I'm not. I don't have like a final opinion, really, like a final verdict on uh, mm-hmm. the nine map pool yet. But at the end of the day, yeah, nine maps. It's hard to get as many reps on that many maps. That's just that's just logical. Um, yeah. But I uh, I do enjoy seeing more maps. I do enjoy mixing things up. Uh, we were also talking, and Seth was even mentioning that just a lot came in at the same time with repick being added as well. So I do like fresh new things in the game, but it's a lot right now. Um, so just kind of trying to adjust to all that, I'd say. But I'm still excited to see how it plays out. I don't, I don't really have any issues with it, but I don't know. it's it's just hard to say right now, I guess. Um, everyone's kind of has the same issues with it, though, right? Everyone's got a lot of maps to work on and only so much time. So it's not like. I'm in any different position over here, but yeah, it's a lot. Then I have a follow-up question, which is, do you think Outback should have been in that nine map pool instead of any other map? Nothing in particular. Yes or no? Yes, I think so. You think Outback should have been in? I think so. Marm? I hate Outback. Ah, so. the rework? That wasn't enough? I, don't I just don't like it. That's fair. Well, no. Yeah, I don't play rank, so I have no idea. <laughs> The last time we, my team was one of the teams that play tested the original Outback. Mm. So that was the only time I've ever played Outback. I don't even know what they changed off of when we play tested it. I don't, I don't care. If it's not in comp, I don't care. That's fair. And regarding the nine maps, is it the same kind of vibe as, as Troy? It's like nine maps is, is, you know, it's more hours to scrim, more map, or the same hours are to scrim than more maps. Yeah. I like for assuming the leagues are still best of one, I think. It's not a big deal there because I feel like for the most part, you're probably going to get old maps played a lot of the time anyway, mm-hmm. in like a best of one. I think the real worry comes into like when you go to majors and stuff like that, you're supposed to be seeing the best teams with the best gameplay. But if there's a if, if, if it's operating under the same system where it's, you know, ban one, pick one, best of threes, you're going to have like a ton of like just mediocre gameplay because just it, it's not going to be possible for teams to have nine even eight probably good maps right like even under a seven map pool a lot of teams are maybe running like six good maps and maybe the six map is like an average map right so maybe they're running five good maps now you're adding you know three completely new maps with a completely new system it's a lot to prepare for and i think you know in best of threes it's really going to be like, I, I feel like one team just gets smoked on the other team's map, then your team smokes them on your map, and then it just all, like, all hell breaks loose on the tiebreaker map. Like, I feel like, I, I know they want diversity and, you know, new maps and stuff like that. It's exciting. But at the same time, I, I do think you will get less than stellar gameplay on a lot of these maps because now teams cannot sit there and practice the same six maps. Now they have to, you know, fit in three more maps, and it's just all that does is take less time away from everything. So it's just going to be worse gameplay, in my opinion. Would you rather be for a system where you have the seven map pool, and instead of introducing, you know, two new maps and replacing one, where you just like straight up remove two or three maps and then put in two or three new maps, still keeping that seven map pool overall? Yeah, I would rather it stay at seven, and if they want to take out coastline and whatever, do that, than expand it to nine and then don't like separate thing but to me it also doesn't make sense to do that and then at the same time change how the game is played because they're adding the maps and then they're adding attacker repick and uh, so far through scrims i don't think attacker repick is like insane but it changes the way the game's played right as an attacker now you don't have reveal phase so you don't know what they're running so you you know you have to figure out what they're running and then as a defender, you can't change what you have, but the attacker can change everything. So it's huge changes to how the game is played. And then you're also having to do that while playing three maps that you potentially haven't played before. And it's it's a lot, and I, I do think it'll lead to some uh, less than great games. Yeah, so I think the, from Ubisoft's standpoint, the attacker repick was announced, I think, basically a year ago at this point, like a very long time back. 
And that was when the game was in a more defender favorite meta game. Mm -hmm. And then obviously, fast forward a year when this mechanic gets introduced, it just happens to be that we're kind of in an attacker or equal favored meta game. So yeah. this change was intended for a good purpose to even back the numbers. But because of how the game has just progressed, it already happened by itself. And now it is further swaying attackers to be favored. Although I'll, from seeing Twitter, a lot of pro players and coaches, they initially said, and, and I believe you said that as well, Seth, originally... Attacker repick is like incredibly broken. And then, you know, a little bit of time goes by, you've been screaming with it, and then it's like, okay, it's still kind of broken, but it's a little bit better than it was mm -hmm. originally. Yeah. I think something to keep in mind is just the natural way a meta will always progress is mm -hmm. that as time goes on, when, when it first starts, defense is going to be at its strongest. And as time goes on, I think attackers naturally are going to get stronger and stronger just because you're you're becoming more and more used to what you have to deal with as an attacker mm -hmm. right whereas the defense maybe you take a little bit of time to figure out like what's the best setup but once you figure out what the best setup is what more can you really do right obviously you can change things up but then you're just changing things up just to throw off the attackers it's not necessarily that it's a better setup it's just that now it's not what the the attacks used to dealing with um, so I think keeping that in mind is, is kind of important. Like we didn't necessarily need attacker repick because we had these chain at first it was very defensive sided when, when my first got added, right? When the yeah. shields first got changed and it was very defensive sided. Then we got some nerfs to Wamai. We got some nerfs to Jaeger. All, like well, we got all these nerfs coming in and then slowly also people got more and more used to attacking it. And then the attack. The meta just started shifting more and more towards attack. But now, yes, now we get attacker repick shifted even more that way. And obviously in our heads, we're like, oh my God, that's like incredibly strong for attackers. But mm -hmm. it's the same thing where like you need more time to develop. Okay, what's what are the best ops to pick for the site every time, right? Like you, we're not going to instantly load in and know the best lineup to pick on every single site and the best reaction every single time with repick. But eventually... You know, one team figures it out on one map. You watch a VOD of that team. Now you know what's the best on that map, maybe, right? And so on and so forth. And all of a sudden, attack probably becomes pretty, pretty OP, right? So attackers they get a tag a repick, and defenders they get Thorn, right? That that's essentially the comparison. Mm -hmm. Are we expecting Thorn to sway the numbers back in the defensive side favor, or are we expecting Thorn to be kind of a pushover operator that won't see that much play in competitive? Uh, I don't know. I mean, her her gun's good. Her um, gun's good, yeah. I think she's she's really good for, like, um, kind of, like, information of where people are, like, if they're pushing up stairwells or stuff. Um, I, th I definitely think it can be useful in, in certain situations, but I don't know if it's going to outweigh the attacker repick kind of thing, because, I mean, all, you can basically change all five attackers, so. Yeah. What about Asami, then? That's not going to be for this season of stage one, but for stage two going forward, yeah. we'll see Asami get introduced. A lot of people in casual play on Reddit, Twitter, etc., they are expecting her to be like a Thatcher Valkyrie, either played a lot or banned a lot. And mm -hmm. of course, this is extremely early. You, I don't even know if you guys have screamed with the operator because it's not relevant for you guys yet. But just looking at it from the outside point of view with the current situation, if you've played test server, do you expect Asami to have a presence? Um... I mean, yeah, definitely on some maps. I mean, I saw, like, a picture on, like, Clubhouse of her holding rafters, mm. and she, like, put one thing on each rafter, and, like, you just... I mean, there's no way you can, like, push that. Um, so, I mean, she's definitely going to be able to lock down areas really well whenever she uh, gets into comp. Have you theory crafted super at all? Or have you not bothered yet? Yeah, if it's not in comp, I don't care. But in, in regards <laughs> to, like, Thorn, I think it would probably be played 0% of the time if we didn't have a shield. Mm. Um, the shield, especially with like Goyo losing his two shields, can be useful on certain things, but I do think it's like a pretty mid uh, operator. The gadgets I don't find. Like the gadgets, I suppose, are more of a like sound cue for somebody being somewhere than they are for like being lethal, which I mean can be somewhat useful maybe on like roams and stuff, but yeah, I don't I don't think it's a great operator. I've in general, I've just never been a fan, like, going back to attack a repick, I've never been a fan of, like, attack or repicks announced a year ago when the map is defender-sided, mm -hmm. or, or when the game is defender-sided. It's now attacker-sided, but then they're still just going to release it. You know, the Goyo change was announced a while ago when the map 
when it was leaning towards attacker sided. Now we're taking shields away, so it's going to be more like they're just stacking everything for attack, but it's because they've decided ahead of time changes that they're going to make. But if they would just make the change when they announce it, then it would actually have the impact they're intending. Like if they announce attacker repick and just release it a year ago when the game is defender sided, you're going to have the impact you want because now you're changing a defensive meta to be more balanced. If they just announce they're taking shields away from Goyo and just release it, okay, now Goyo's not going to have shields. But instead, you wait until now the game has already shifted towards attack, and now we're just stacking everything against, like, against defense, which I guess in a way it's, like, maybe intended because that is more entertaining to watch. Fast-paced gameplay, like, more gunfight kind of thing is more entertaining for a viewer, which is why I didn't think Coastline should be removed, to be honest. Mm. But at the same time... Rainbow is a strategy-based FPS. That's what made it so popular. That's why people love it so much. It's not like other FPS. The more you take away from the defense side of it, the more strategy you're moving from the game. Eventually, you just have to be like, well, these guys are going to know the site. They're going to know what utility we have. Just contest everything. Like, just mm -hmm. don't let them in the building. And it's like, there's no strategy there. It's just, you know, you have to play crazy or they're just they're going to have a perfect operator. Like you have to kill sledge or they're just going to go above and sledge you. Like, it's just, uh, I think it's going to be interesting. I, I just think the direction they're going with the game is away from strategy. Remember right before I retired, when we were streaming coastline in G2, our half the rounds that we played on defense was like, let's get super aggressive. Maybe go for a double or triple spawn peak, because if we don't get a pick somewhere, we will naturally just get choked out the map and eventually lose it out. Mm -hmm. Or we'll come down to getting a crazy shot mid round, of course. And I would argue that this Invitationals was both the most close in terms of competition, looking between like top to bottom team, arguably, but also arguably the most aggressive or chaotic that we've seen in a long time at a very high level of play where we see a lot of people, you know, individual play, early extension uh tsm for example the winning team they would extend out on every single map that they played on defense and try and get in the face of their attackers and set up scenarios that they might not be used to for example in the clubhouse basement room they would put geo and strip on castle mm -hmm. which is not something that we typically see yet it worked right the pocket strats if you will getting mm -hmm. aggressive yeah i mean that that's just the nature of the game right um, yeah. as, as it becomes more attacker sided you can't bunker up and just let the attackers execute on the site uh, you can do that if you think that the other team won't have a good enough execute. And there are some teams that actually you could do it that against. Mm. There are some teams, like tier one teams, that are bad at executing. And if you give them the whole map and let them execute, they'll probably just lose to themselves. But that's not usually the case with the best teams. And more often than not, you do have to extend like that. And yeah, TSM realizes it. I also think it very much suits their players. Uh I think it's very suitable for players like Merck and Bolo to be like as extended and in, in your face as possible. Um, but yeah, I, th I think that's just how the game's naturally progressed. And it's just uh, uh, definitely their team's play style, but yeah. I think the attacker repick is like actually makes that even more risky. Like obviously, so the idea as a defense is the way you win now, you need to expand out have like a lot of map control and just fight for that a little bit and then like you know just try to waste as much time but now the attacker repick if 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 i'm a team and i see you're extending oh, all yeah. over the map if i just hit sight on you bring a bunch of like lion yank like whatever i want for sight because i know you're roaming i, I mean the guy in sight's gonna have fun like good luck being <laughs> a smoke player or something yeah. and mm -hmm. then if if i see you are roaming what if i just bring like lion jack or dokubi and now you're all just gonna die like it's, you know, I, I don't know if we're going to see like that initially because with attacker repick, obviously there's going to be learning curve and teams will get more and more comfortable with it by the time like invites around like, yeah, I feel like defense will be just absolutely horrific because right now we're all just like, okay, like, you know, maybe we'll just start bringing the good lineups for this site. Mm -hmm. But when you get more used to it, when you get like better ideas of like how you want to drone for this sort of thing. You might be like, okay, well, they have three rumors. Let's just fucking kill the people in sight. Like, it's it's going to progressively get worse, I feel like. So this first stage, it's going to be the messiest. It's probably going to be the more, like, defender 
sided. Not that it's going to be favored towards defense, but I do feel like it's going to get progressively uh, more attacker favored as the year goes on, which, as I've already said, I'm not, I'm not in love with the strategic aspect of that. Yeah. Welcome to your first season of Project, by the way, Marm. With the <laughs> yeah. tag or repick and having fun on defense and whatnot. Um, I don't know if, if any of you have a thought on this, but whenever I was in Pro League, I always preferred playing defense, which obviously back when I played, it was a more defender side game, but I always liked the aspect of you set up a problem and then the enemy has the problem solve it, and you can kind of expect what they will do and then you can counter react to what you think they will do. Do you, any of you guys have like a preferred side when you're playing the game competitively where you're like, I love being an attack because I can just go crazy in entry or I like being defense because I like sitting still? I like attack because of the problem solving part. Okay. I enjoy the problem solving part of the game. Um, I do enjoy defense as well for like more, not less of the setup part, but more of the, the counter part of it. Um, if you notice a team has an answer to your setup, how, how can you on the spot kind of, kind of, react to that and and break the run back in your favor back in your favor mm. um i do enjoy both sides but i think if i had to pick i would probably pick attack okay martin i'll probably pick defense um <clears throat> i just like i like trying to like come up with like or like see how like the strats go against like the like how they attack it um and i just like the ops war on defense mm. like more fun to play like more utility like smoke and stuff um but yeah definitely like a, definitely defense way more than attack what about playing stuff like SMG 11 against the 100 or 150 bullet LMG being finger stemmed with instant ADS speed at 2.0 scope and all you got is 17 bullets on an SMG 11? I think just hitting that or killing that person just like 20 times more satisfying. For sure. Probably. But how um, often do you actually get the kill being the SMG 11 player? <laughs> no. Um, not enough. Yeah, not enough. So. Not enough. She says that now because she hasn't had to play against like Bolo and Rick, yeah. <laughs> like Rick's that's like, true people with like the Sophia LMG. Uh, so might change my we'll mind see. after. Yeah. Uh, well, you know me. I always love to just uh, show people how much smarter than them I am. So as an IGL, I obviously I like attack better. Yeah. Yeah. I think I think that's a given. I mean, I I love, for example, like I overall I love defending, but for clubhouse, I much prefer attack because when you have good strategy and you have good plans and ideas you can get an attacker side of clubhouse with ease. Whereas mm -hmm. if you have, we got jail structure, just not the greatest minds in the team. You might struggle in clubhouse attack, but it's really like, a, it is my experience and my opinion. It's, it can be very back and forth where you can be a great attack in team or quite the opposite. Yeah. yeah. Looking forward at stage one that we're about to be in very soon, actually. We don't really know the format, probably anything else of that kind, but looking at the roster change that happened for about half the teams more, more so in, in yeah. the NL, who came out on top and who are is at the bottom after the changes that we saw? I know, Super, you've been very vocal about Xset. You even spoke about it not too long ago. You mentioned coach name, Bodega. You mentioned the players and their Brazilian blood. And it was just natural to them to be aggressive. Mm -hmm. Do you expect Xset in particular to place high or to place low? Uh, I, I think like on paper, Xset's uh, like a, actually a very talented team. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, Yaga and Kino have already been to two invites and they're only been playing for one year i don't know how that math works out but somehow that's <laughs> happened um and they performed well at, at that and you know those are players who bring a lot of experience to them spirits to me was uh you know i can kind of like watch cl games or like play scrim a cl team or something and you'll notice if like one person is just like like on another level i thought spirits was kind of like that i think i thought he was like on another level than a lot of his competition and, and T2 and spirits has even played an invite once already as well. Uh, and then, you know, they're bringing in Gomez and Diaz who they've been playing CL for a long time, but I think a lot of people think they're at least mechanically very gifted. So I, I feel like they're a team that's very skilled. The question is going to be, I think I'm curious to see how they do roles on that team. Cause from an outside point of view, there's no IGL. You know, Kino plays Smoke, but I don't even really think Kino is like a support player in that aspect. So their their roles are more of the question to me. And like with this attacker repick thing, where in theory the smarter teams will be able to take advantage of this, does them not having like a true IGL or something like that, will that affect how strong they're going to be on attack, for instance, right? Mm. But having a team full of aimers, maybe that means they're going to be like better than at like what most teams are going to be on defense 
because they can play in your face. So I, I think they're a really talented team. I definitely don't think they'll be near the bottom um, just based off of the players they have. And, you know, for, for as much as I clown Budega, it's not like he's just absolutely clueless, right? Like he is coming from, uh, you know, uh, success in, in Brazil. And if they're able to play the style that he wants them to play, I think they'll probably progressively get better. To me, it's just more so can an, can an NA team play, a, a, you know, a LATAM style of siege is, remains to be seen. And how, and how will that work against NA? Because, you know, outside of, like, FaZe, um, I don't think NA really had huge issues with, like, LATAM. Like, NA and MIBR are, like, really good teams. But, I mean, those are, are also teams that have been together forever and extremely talented, right? The the other LATAM teams, I feel like their play styles were not really working that well against NA. So I, I think it's really interesting to see how that's going to play out, to be honest. I don't expect them to be aggressive if anything, right? I yeah, think that's what sure. you're getting at, yeah. Yeah. I One thing I think is that I think it's almost hard for him to implement his play style as only a coach. I think you almost have to have someone in-game that's also implementing and like pushing the play style to the players um i'm sure he could probably do it in scrims right he can be talking during rounds and scrims and uh reinforcing his ideas but i don't necessarily know like if the players on the team necessarily have the same vision as the game i also i don't even know if the players on the team have a vision for the game because I, that's a very common thing like there's plenty of players the majority of players don't have a vision for the game they just play the game and they're part of the system that the igl or the coach has mm. and i think if only the coach has this vision and these players don't necessarily they they just they're just listening to what he says and they don't have anyone in game kind of reinforcing this like hey this is how we need to play this round this is how we need to play this site no no, no we can't do that like this we have to we have to play it this way if they don't have someone doing that are they really going to be able to implement the action play style? I don't know. Yeah, I, I think what he said is like especially true just in general. The the role of an IGL, obviously, it's always going to be underrated from outsider point of view. But if you don't have somebody in the game, kind of keeping the team on track or or focusing on what you're trying to do or need to do, is it just going to turn into like FPL like mayhem? And maybe that will work for a couple of times because. Um, it kind of, in a way, would almost remind me of like the old '92 Dream Team, where it's like mm. they can win a game or two, especially in best of ones, because they'll, you know, they'll just surprise you. They'll just do some crazy stuff. But over a course of a year, like if that's actually how you play, you don't really have a sense of direction. Then you know you're you're not going to end up being that good. It's just the good teams will take advantage of you. Maybe you'll pop off every now and then and get a win. But it's not something that's going to be consistent because you don't have a consistent voice. It's just always randomness coming at you. Yeah. Do you have a side in alarm? It's like you joining Mirage. Is there like a clear idea of how you guys want to play the game and also like who's kind of, you know, providing that for you? Or is it more of like a, we're going to figure it out as a unit and just kind of see what happens? Yeah, I think we're still trying to find like our identity in a sense. Obviously, like with like three fish new people, um, it's going to be like a lot harder. Um, but I think we're trying to push it into a different identity than the old mirage mm -hmm. um but yeah i mean so far it's uh it's a big learning curve and it's um yeah it's super fun i'm excited to see who you guys play first because i don't know the schedule yet because obviously let's say you know you have three new fish so to speak or quote unquote new yeah and you face a really big team let's say you play tsm first for example it's one of those like oh snap like we're gonna get rolled right it's hard to go with confidence against a team that has just one invite for example Oh, I don't know. I mean, you just gotta you just gotta go in like with your game plan and just be prepared. And um, you know, obviously it's like a tough team, but you know, I think anything can happen in best of ones. So, so we trust the process. Yeah, yeah we trust the process. Any um, a any thoughts from your side on who you think like had the best roster change this season going to stage one? So like one team where like that was a good change. I like that one. Um. I mean, not really. I think there's like a, a lot of interesting ones. I think Beast Coast is going to be really interesting to watch. Um, same with Exet. Um, Slash is back. You know? Yeah. I'm excited for that one as well. Yeah, you know, Forrest on Astralis, that's going to be f fun to watch. Um, I know he's he's been he's a really good player. So 
I think I think everyone's gonna be really interesting to watch to see how it goes for the first few weeks. Um, and then I guess we'll kind of see like who kind of got like the best like pickup probably. I could imagine it being kind of scrappy because you got new teams, new rosters, tag a repick, new maps, bigger map pool, new operator coming out. Thankfully, Fortnite is probably not gonna be like that crazy daisy, but it's a lot of changes to add on top of also restructuring the roster. So, Troy, do you think there's a benefit to teams like yourself in Dark Zero, like Seth in Sonics, where it's like, because you have the same core five players, do you have like a slight leg up because there's less things to have to focus on? Uh, yeah, I definitely think that's the case. I do think you can also make an argument that like, maybe the best time to make a change is when so much change is happening in the mm -hmm. first place, right? Because every roster change ends up being almost like a fresh start. Even if you have stuff to build on, it's still kind of a fresh start. So maybe just because of a meta shift, such a big meta shift, it naturally makes it more of a fresh start anyways for these other teams, right? We have to pick up all these new maps. I will say theme park, some teams don't even really have to pick up a new map, right? Like for example, like TSM was a good theme park team. They literally have the same roster and the map is the exact same. Mm. Um, so I, I think it, I think it's, it's a lot of change, but I think for new teams, it's probably a good timing for it because other teams are also dealing with so much. Any closing thoughts, Seth? Yeah, I mean, just in, in terms of, uh, you know, what he said, if teams that stick together longer typically are going to have greater success, they're going to have better chemistry, it'll be easier for them to learn things, in my opinion. I mean, even look at TSM winning Invite. It took them three tries to win Invite, and they pretty much had the same team besides Pojo and, and Gio. Or sorry, Pojo and uh, Chala. Yeah. So like, and Pojo even stayed in with the coach. So it's not like he completely left. And NIP, same thing. They, you know, they kept the same team three, like two, three times. They, you know, they have the same core. So I definitely think if you can manage to not be frustrated by if you have like lackluster results or you know you're not doing as well as you think, and rather than look to just rather than think the solution is just to make a roster change and just change it up, you should be focusing on trying to uh, fix it rather than looking for what's next. Because if, if if you, if you're struggling and you just start looking out there and like, okay, well, who could replace this person? This person's mm -hmm. doing bad. You're automatically not thinking about how you can get better. You're just thinking about what's next. And if you're constantly worrying about what's next, then your team will just never get better. Cause you're always just in a constant flux of, you don't think there's an issue besides this person when clearly one person's not an issue if the team's not good. So I, I think teams just, the ones that stick together are going to be better. The majority of the rosters in NA that are, are the better teams have cores or the majority of the teams have been together for a while. It's not a coincidence. I, I think you just, if you can, you know, keep your finger off the trigger and not get rid of people, it's always better to just stick it, stick with it. That's why, you know, when, for instance, when I said the Sonics roster for 2022 is staying the same, if we go out there and lose every game stage one, we're having the same roster the whole year. It's, it's just, that's the way it's going to be. There's no changes in the middle of the season. So, uh, obviously people operate under different ideals. That's just how I think about it. I really resonate with it because I think that was, uh, the last roster I was a part of, that was our situation where there was always a player that was supposed to get replaced and that was supposed to make us better mm -hmm. and in reality i mean until the very moment where g2 just released a revival video yesterday like it's been a downfall ever since it's always been about what's next instead of how can we fix this situation at hand and it seems to be that their their solution was to do a redo right just completely scrap it and start over and then hopefully work on the problem so i think what you just said the entire pair um, entire phrase is extremely important advice for people that wanted to get into competitive Marm, who just entered competitive, that sense is right there. Bring it to your team if they haven't seen the podcast and be like, guys, this is what Seth said. We should stick it out, figure out the problems, work on them, communicate. Especially if you live together, which is a bit different in America, because like you're going to be breathing up and down each other's necks like every day. In Europe, you know, after scrims, you close the PC and you're just like, oh, these teams, like, these guys suck. Mm -hmm. I hate these guys. <laughs> you can't do that here, right? You, you can, but it's like you're... If you have that negative aura in the physical presence of the space every single day, it's, it it's going to really easy. tear your team apart. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you can't have that. I was gonna say I I have nothing else in my book here. If you guys have any topics you want to go over, or if chat, you guys have anything specifically you would like to know, 
We've kind of been looking on the screen. We have a big screen to our right here that we're looking at. If you have any questions for anyone in particular or for all of us, Hannibal has one right off the bat, actually. Oh, Question about like Super's yeah. take on nine maps instead of seven. Isn't it possible that by reducing the overall quality of the gameplay, by reducing ability to perfect... Oh, yeah. Can we get a scroll? <laughs> <laughs> we lost it. Something about skill gap. You're actually increasing the skill gap between good teams and bad teams based on natural mid-round adaptation and pocket strats that teams won't be able to be prepared for. Uh, I don't think you're... I don't think you're necessarily increasing the skill gap because, if anything, if you're going to a map where it's gonna be kind of like a shit show then the good team is like like i said if you're a team that just plays crazy and stuff like if, if it's crazy enough you can just have that one map where you just win the game uh because maybe the good team's not as prepared for that as they are for the, the majority of uh, the maps now i think the advantage the good teams are gonna have usually is like like we were literally just saying the good teams typically have been together longer because the good teams don't make changes that's you know if you're good why would you mm. so just the the chemistry and probably the map pool will in general be in their favor but like if, if week one say tsm play against uh mirage right and the map goes to skyscraper i feel like that's a win for mirage in their mind because TSM could be like dog shit at Skyscraper. Mirage could be crazy at Skyscraper. Like you don't know what you're walking into, which makes it anything can happen in those kind of games. Yeah. I think what you mentioned about it in uh, Best of Threes is also a good point where like at an international event, it's better teams at the end of the day, like better teams are playing there. Uh, and the map pools like they'll they'll both have deep map pools like odds are just you have a better foundation if you're at a major if you're a top team and there's more teams that have you know longer standing rosters there more chemistry deeper map pools all that and i do think there is an advantage the absolute best teams will be able to you know adapt and play on a weaker map and make it work but i think there's only so many teams that will be able to do that i think at the end of the day things will be skewed into one team's favor or another more significantly on their map picks than in the past, I would say. I, I think attacking, like, in that instance, I think attacker repick is literally the saving grace for, like, good teams because it, a, a good team, in theory, can identify things that they can change quicker than a bad team so they can abuse that mechanic more than a bad team would be able to. So even if it is, like, a shit show map, the good team, in theory, can use the attacker repick more to their advantage than the other team would be able to. So in a way, that's like the saving grace of, I think, like top teams. Patriots, question for Canadian. DC didn't seem comfortable keeping players on roles all the way through SI. Will we see more stability and consistency in Dark Zero's roles moving forward? We had the same roles all through SI. <laughs> Next question. Next question. I saw a question which said, uh, are there more wheels or doors from Nomienos? Now, I, I did some extensive thinking of this last night when I saw it on Twitter. I'm curious, Marm, are there more doors or more wheels in the world? Wheels. I think that's a solid answer. I mean, look at this room. Like, each chair here has, like, five wheels. and There's, there's one, one door. door. Yeah. Yep. All right. Good job. Yeah, but You like, passed. What if your <laughs> eyelids are doors? What if... And what if what your if mouth eye is, eye is a door, door, your ears are doors? Okay, now we're getting too complicated. I think, yeah. medically speaking, an eye is an eye and not a door. But well, what the, the eyelids. The only thing I have to say is that are you a doctor? I, I am not a doctor. <laughs> no, you got me yeah. there. How do we know? <laughs> we need a certified doctor. What does Super think of the new G2 roster? And I think any everyone can kind of give their quick brief on what they think. Uh, I kind of touched on this on my stream yesterday. I'm curious to see them play. Um... I honestly think their roles are going to be interesting because I know Doki, from what they said, it's going to be playing like entry mm. and then Citizen's going to be second entry and, and whatever. And Alamo's going to be, or Alamo, it's going to be like flex work yeah. kind of thing. But, uh, and, and I know they've teamed before and had success. In my opinion, like Doki and Citizen play kind of like the same. Like, I don't think of Doki as like, an, an entry player like i think like rexon or like merc or somebody like that just somebody who just will run in a room like a maniac that's kind of what i think of as an entry player doki to me is more like citizen like the the comparison i use is 
if you watch Citizen, do you think that he plays, or sorry, if you watch Doki, do you think Doki plays more like Grixer and Citizen, or do you think he plays more like Merc and Rexon? And I think everybody would probably say he plays more like Citizen and Grixer. So then he's not a real entry player. So I'm, I'm obviously he's really good. Like they have really skilled players and that can probably make up for that. But I do think their roles are less clear than they appear to be on paper. Yeah, okay. I, I think bas Doki has to be a very aggressive entry for it to work. I actually do think Alamo, I wouldn't be surprised if he steps up and is even more aggressive and less lurky than before. Mm. Um, and I do think Citizen will probably take more of that lurky side. I do think you can't have too many people lurking on a team, though. So and, and I actually think that was an issue always previous on G2 was actually I always thought that at first I thought Citizen and Uno were both very similar in that sense where they both like to play lurky. And then even when you guys got Virtue as well, even he did. Mm. And then all of a sudden it's like you got three people on the map that aren't droning but also aren't pushing so like who's getting shit done yeah like like with kanto obviously they moved on from kanto they said he's struggling or whatever but one thing you'll say about kanto is he is like the yeah. entry player like he doesn't give a shit like the people who are entry players don't give a shit like they're just gonna run in no fear they're confident they'll win the fight and even if they don't get the kill a lot of time that does open up something especially if you have oh, you know like dark zero they have hyper kind of in a second entry role hyper's not a guy where he's gonna miss a refrag right that's very powerful to just have somebody to open it up. But if everybody's just trying to like crouch walk in and like make their way in for like the perfect time, mm. you're going to be slow. And if it doesn't work out, what happens? Like you, you, nobody's running in the room. You're just all sitting there. So uh, I think we'll, we'll see. I, really good team on paper. Definitely questionable roles for me. Oh, yeah. I mean, on paper, the team is insane. Um, it's going to be really interesting to watch the EUL and see how they, you know, stack up against, you know, Eminem, who had. I'd say a pretty decent run at, at invite. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it's, so it's gonna be it's gonna be really fun to watch. You know, Alamo and like Doki and all of them like on the same team, and obviously Alamo switching to a whole new region. Um, it's gonna be really really cool to watch. I do think that, for the record, though, I think this is the best roster G two has had since like your guys' run, basically. I I agree. I think mm -hmm. I I yeah. I think it's the most clear. I think it's the first time since then I, that I think there's probably a more clear vision for mm. how they want to play and the closest semblance to solid roles. So I agree. I do think, I do think it's the most potential out of rosters since then. Twist, another one for super thoughts on PBs or Parabellum with how they have creators and Wimpy, Wimpy being a temporary player with Blast coming in, in the future. If Wimpy does good, how would they move forward with replacing someone with Blast once visa issues have been resolved? Yeah, I think that's kind of a really interesting situation for them because I also think they're trying to transition their team to speak French, in which case Blas obviously speaks French and uh, Wimpy does not. That's something I heard. I don't know if it's yeah, true. Yeah, I heard about that. I, really? I saw that on Twitter. Parabellum want to play, speak French in stage two. Yeah. But obviously Creators doesn't speak French. So, I mean, is he like hooked on like phonics kind of thing like what is he doing over there but like duolingo yeah so <laughs> i think it creates a weird environment in a way because say wimpy because wimpy's never played in pro league a lot of them have never played in pro league they have experience but they're not pro league experience say wimpy pops off and one of the other guys really struggles are they just going to be like okay wimpy like that's it night thanks for you know stick it, like filling in or does now somebody else is like okay maybe this guy can't play at a pro level hmm. But if you're just like saying off the bat, Wimpy's gone no matter what, then okay. But if you're kind of leaving that up in the air, then I do feel like it puts pressure in a way on the people on the team. Because if you don't play well and Wimpy does or somebody else does, maybe you're gone, right? Mm -hmm. And having like a stage to stage pressure of you being dropped is like really awkward to play with, I feel like. Yeah, that'd definitely be like hard on the mental. Like, no, like, you're just going to get dropped after stage one. Yep. Just going into it like that. Before my original Penta roster with Fabian and Dunes in year two, I was on a, in year one, season four, so the first invite, I was on a French super team with, like, Falco, Six Cotre, Livin, myself, Spoken, whatever. And the reason why I went with Fabian's team instead was because Fabian said, you're the only person that does not speak French, so the second things go south, you're the first guy to get kicked. And I was like, 
that's probably very accurate. I'm going to join an English speaking team where I can speak the same language. Yeah. So the same argument could be made here. Where it's like, if you're the odd one out, it's like, are you safe in this team going forward if you don't succeed? This, the only thing is like, so like, does Kool-Aid speak French? Like he's, he's American, mm. right? Penguin, I don't like, he's Canadian, but he's not, he's not French Canadian to my knowledge. I know Esco speaks French. Yeah. He's French Canadian. But... Uh, I, from what I understand, they are trying to transition to uh, being able to speak good enough French for stage two. So let's see if that's a trouble. That close to I mean, it's similar, you know, on X set, they have Yog. He's going to learn Portuguese. So now interesting. Be, uh, Learning languages. <laughs> Uh, the street for the strifle question from Marm. What are the roles on the new Mirage team? If you can tell us. Um, yeah, so I'm on hard breach. Uh, Melted's on flank watch. Uh, Thomas is on flex. And then uh, Benji and Razor are the entries. So, and then it's mostly Ra Razor and Thomas IGLing. Um, but I mean, we all kind of shared burden. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Take one more. Okay. All right. So this is a a basic but good one. Question from Marm: Do you feel nervous playing your first LAN? Um, right now, no. Maybe no, no, when no. I get there. <laughs> when I get there, maybe. Um, but I think it's more of like just like, like excitement. Like you know, this yeah. is something I've wanted for like years, and you know, I've been I've been working hard for it. Um, so I think obviously, like like you said, after that first kill, I think after that it's just gonna it's gonna click. So. I saw a video when I was early on in my proly career, and it spoke about how excitement and like being anxious are two very simple things in terms of symptoms. You know, they get the belly feeling, you get sweaty palms, etc. And uh, and the video said, whenever you're faced with that feeling, tell yourself that oh, you're excited to do this. And yeah. Like, oh, I'm kind of anxious to do yeah. this. And when I started doing that, I, it was like a different experience because I I went in saying. Oh my god, I'm, not I'm about nervous, to be my I'm excited, yeah. yeah. I'm gonna kill this. Instead of going, oh, I'm kind of nervous, I might lose. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So. I think that was that was something I was lucky to learn early on, because like even for like sports growing up, like you know, like a school volleyball tournament, or hockey tournament, whatever it was, like I wouldn't sleep because I was so well, in my head I immediate I was probably my parents. They told me that I was excited and because I was just like, I can't sleep. I don't know why, but I can't sleep. And they're like, oh, you're just excited. Mm. And I'm telling myself, oh, I'm just excited. And then I think naturally I've learned that because it's the same thing even at events a lot of the time. Like, I don't sleep, but it, it is because I'm excited. All I can mm. think about is is the match and like what, how I think this other team's going to play a map, how I want to play a map, stuff like that. So I think, uh, yeah, it's definitely the right way to do it. You feel a lot better about it. And once you get in, you're just in the zone because that's where you want to be. Yeah, with there being like no fans right now and stuff too, it's also it's also kind of like to me it's not that big of a deal. Obviously, I've been playing for a while, but like you're going to a stadium or an arena and you're just playing with nobody watching you. <laughs> like if there's fans screaming at you and stuff, that's a little bit different. And then in the NAL, you might just have like me screaming at you or something. Like, <laughs> but for the most part, like I feel like when you sit down, the only adjustment you really have is like their setup versus your home setup. But yeah. th with no crowd, I I feel like it's like way less like pressure, way less like anxiety about playing. Cool. I think that basically settles it. Yeah. Thank you, chat, for the questions, for watching. Thank you, Super, for coming as well. Great year that you've had so far. And for 2022, you've confirmed that the roster will stay the same. So we'll be watching that as well. Same story for you, Canadian. You guys might make, make role changes again. You guys have been doing that. You can't say. Well, easy do with making roster changes. <laughs> um, we'll be watching. And Marm, good luck with your beginning of your pro league career. We'll be watching Thank with you. excitement every single week. Cheerios. Thank you, guys.